the Antarctic thing now since I came to MSU in 1984, so about 36 years. And there's an old saying that uh, you go down the first time for the adventure and then you continue to go down because you don't fit into society anymore. Uh, Sydney asked me uh, a few minutes ago uh, if I missed Antarctica, incidentally, I should be in Antarctica heading down now because of COVID. Our Antarctic field season was canceled. Uh, we have to go through New Zealand and it gets very complicated. They're very strict with their quarantine. And it. Um, so the National Science Foundation basically canceled our season. Uh, so we're missing, um, a, a, we have a 40 year record going and we're actually missing a, a, a really important year, but we'll live through it. So. Uh, again, thanks for, for whoever's on here. I can't see, and it's too bad I can't be in person. I've given a number of honors lectures. I gave one last year, and I, I really had fun. And a number of students came up and said I took to their parents to Antarctica with me a long time ago before they were born, so I must be getting old. But today what I want to do is talk about this the a hidden world beneath the Antarctic ice sheet. And this, uh, I hope you can see my pointer here. Um, here is Antarctica, it's fifth largest continent, and I'm kind of like in this picture, peeling back the ice. And I'll talk a little more about that, just to see this world underneath that's been covered with ice for 20 million years. So what I want to do today is talk about the detection of the systems under here, mostly lakes and rivers. Okay, there's this ice is water, it's just a solid form of water. So we're looking at liquid lakes and rivers. and then I, I have the second bullet here, the race to be first. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the United States, the Russians, and the British, the United Kingdom, I should say, uh, were all vying to be the first to drill into one of these lakes. And I'll tell you a little bit about this. It wasn't really a race. We're all colleagues. But uh, in the end, uh, um, it turned out to be who could do this first. And then the logistics, as you can imagine, getting to the bottom of the planet and uh, and drilling through thousands of meters of ice is, is not easy. And then finally, discovery. And that's really what it's all about as a scientist is uh, making new discoveries. So uh, what I want to do, maybe, let's see if I can do this. There we go. My lab uh, studies sort of geomicrobiology, the cryosphere. And, and it's a very interdisciplinary uh, type of a lab. So I have, I have glaciologists, geologists, geochemists, I have climate people. A lot of my students are- Let me just get a right here. What's that? Oop. Anyway, ecology. So we do, we combine all these into the field of geomicrobiology here in the center. So it's a little hard to keep up on, but uh, that's how I, I always tell my students uh, discoveries are made at the intersection of disciplines. Okay, so let's get into this a little bit about Antarctica, some facts. It's the fifth largest continent down here. We always see maps here of this Antarctica as being this big white thing, and it, it, it's what it looks like from space. Uh, it's the highest continent, all right? The South Pole is over 10,000 feet. It's the coldest, uh, the coldest temperature ever measured is minus 89 centigrade. I believe that's about plus, I'm sorry, about minus 114 Fahrenheit, and that's without wind. That's cold. That was over here in East Antarctica. It's been ice covered in certain areas for 20 million years. That's a long time. So what's underneath is not seeing the light of day for uh, a long time, a lot of time for evolution. There's a lot of ice. Okay, there's 27 million cubic kilometers of ice. It's a little over 6 million uh, cubic miles. And 70% of the planet's fresh water is tied up in that ice sheet. 90% of our ice is in that ice sheet. So if it melted, and flowed out into the ocean, this is what we would see if we took a tour of the Statue of Liberty. It'd be about almost neck deep in water. There'd be a 60 meter uh, sea level rise. And I'll talk about a little of uh, that a little more uh, sea level rise, but not a lot. Okay, so these are ancient ecosystems beneath the Antarctic ice sheet. And in this cartoon, what I've done here is lifted off uh, the, the ice and try to see, uh, image what's underneath of the ice. So all the little blue dots are lakes. We know there's more than 400 lakes under there now. And the the, the blue lines are, are rivers. And some of these rivers are quite large, or river systems. This area here, I'm gonna show you this a lot more later. This is covered with ice. 
It's the Ross Ice Shelf, and it's about the size of the Amazon Basin and area. And you can see some of these river basins under the ice, they rival the Amazon in size, okay? So what I wanna do is next is look at this uh, Lake Vostok. Uh, that's where the Russians, I put little flags, it's a Russian flag. And that's where they were attempting to get through the ice there. And it's about 12,000 feet thick. It's four kilometers. It's a pretty thick ice sheet there. The British over here at Lake Ellsworth and then the United States program uh, where we studied. And I led this team, uh, these teams, the Willans and the Mercer teams. Uh, and we studied two lakes in this area. So if we pull that ice off, this is the, what we think it'll look like. Okay, so how do we know lakes exist under there? Okay, so here's Antarctica. And I just wanna show you one thing. This is that Ross, that Ross ice shelf. And it's, so this, this area here is about the size of France and it floats over the ocean, okay? So ice is flowing from these high areas over 10 to 12,000 feet. The South Pole is right up in here, and it flows out into the ocean, covers the ocean, and jams up here. You got to ask yourself, what would happen if this ice shelf broke up and we pulled the plug? What we would do is see all the ice in Antarctica flow into the ocean very rapidly, and we'd see sea level rise. Okay, so what I'm doing now is zooming in into the, an area right up in here, and there's um, an, a lake that we've been studying with radar, and you can see the outline of the lake because the ice floats on the lake. And with radar, we can actually see that lake. Watch the lake change down here. And you'll see when it, so the lake goes down and comes up. So we look at the surface of the lake and that's how we can see water flowing under a mile of ice. All right, here's another one. Here's another little movie and you can see a side view. So the lake, here's a lake and here's a lake. And you can see it's flat on top because the ice floats over the top. And when that lake drains, the, the surface goes down and it drains into this lower lake and it goes up. So that's how we study flow under ice sheets. We can look at the surface, go up and down with satellites and we can get an idea of the hydrology. So we have to invoke geophysics teams. Okay, so now I wanna take you to the largest lake in Antarctica that we know of so far. It's Lake Vostok. This is a Russian station. Vostok was the name of the spacecraft that put the first cosmonaut into space, Yuri Gagarin from the Russians, and they named this lake after him. So if you look right over here, here's the Ross Ice Shelf again, floating over the ocean. And Lake Vostok is over here covered with about 12,000 feet of ice. And this is gonna be a movie. This is a Canadian space agency made this. And they're gonna, you're gonna be, take a like fly right down the lake. The lake's about 160 miles long. It's a big lake, and uh, we should be able to see what's going on. So the, the Canadians are pretty cool. They put music to things. So even, this is, uh, but if you look over here, you're gonna see the outline of the lake because the ice floats over the top of the lake as it moves over. You can see the outline here. Okay. We're going to fly down this 150 plus mile lake. And there's right there is Vostok Station, a little white dot, and that's the Russian base. The white line going in, you can see it here in this uh, kind of drawn out picture, is where they drive their tractors in for supplies. So this is a huge lake, uh, one of the largest on our planet. And, and here's the, I put together a little table of Great Lakes of the World. And Baikal in Russia is definitely, if you've ever been there, it's a beautiful lake, um, one of the, the largest. It's quite deep. It's got a lot of water in it. You can put all the Great Lakes in it. Vostok is number six in terms of volume and number three in terms of depth. And it's under about, uh, four, about two miles of ice, and it hasn't seen the light of day for maybe 20 million years. Okay, it's cold there, it's a hard place to work, and the Russians have been, have been working there since the late 50s. Here's a picture I took out of their logbook in 1983, and if you know Russian, this is the 28th of July. And that temperature right there is the coldest day ever recorded on Earth, minus 89.2 degrees um, centigrade. It wasn't exactly warm that whole week, okay, minus 60, to minus 80 in here, so cold place, tough, and plus it's over 10,000 feet. 
so you can get altitude sickness. They're very difficult. Here's a little cartoon I put together of Lake Vostok. Okay, this is a, a lake we've been trying to get to for a long time. So I'm going to cover uh, the, the Russian exploration. So you'll see a little Russian flag here. And the ice is flowing over the lake, going out to the ocean. Here's their borehole. And they drilled through and actually popped into the lake. I'll, I'll show you some pictures of that uh, a few years ago. But it's really important to look at some of the dynamics of this lake. Okay, so they cored through here and produced a 420,000 year climate record. That's four glaciations on Earth. And the data from that core was the first data set to show that temperature and CO2 change together. Because from this core, they can get gases. That's one thing ice cores give you, that tree rings and sediment cores from the ocean do not tell you. You, you can't get the, the gas record. Because in here, about 10% of this ice is gas. It's trapped from the atmosphere. It snows on top, it turns into ice, goes down to the bottom. All right, so the ice is flowing across. And I just want to show you this little group of, of uh, parameters here. This is so that when it melts, the lake is, I won't go into the whole hydraulics of the lake, but you get melt on one end, and then 100 miles downstream, up, down on the other end of the lake, some of the lake water freezes into the bottom. Okay. So all the material that goes into the lake, water, microbes, which is a lot of what I study, inorganic particles, gases, and ions, they go into the lake, and then the lake water freezes in on the bottom, and then as this um, ice sheet flows, this accreted ice, which is about 240 meters thick, goes crunching out and working its way down to the ocean. So there's some little cartoons. There's People thought there's geothermal, some methane coming in from the bottom, and the water is about 1,000 meters deep. There's two kinds of this accretion ice. One's a little dirty in sediments around the shoreline, and one's really clear. The Russians call it gem ice. And then I got a little picture here of clathrates, and the clathrates are basically under a certain concentration of gas, temperature, and pressure. Um, the gas gets encapsulated with a little icy shell and forms this little clathrate. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. So right now, if you're going to be the scientist leading this expedition, you got to be scratching your head as, whoa, look at all this stuff coming in. And we know there's about 10% air in glacial ice, in bubbles. But we know when we freeze water, gases are expelled. They're segregated and moved out. So this is very clear ice, there's no bubbles. So all the gases have to build up down into here. Same with the chemistry and maybe even the microbes. So things get concentrated. So we looked at that before we even started drilling. And this is one of the heaviest data slides I'll show you guys, so don't, so bear with me. It's pretty simple. Here's dissolved gas in liters per kilogram of water, okay? And uh, it's concentration. And down here is the age of the lake in residence times. Now that's kind of tricky. And, and, and what that means is the lake takes about, I've got the number down here for Lake Vostok, it's about 10,000 years to replace all that water in the lake. Okay, so about 10,000 years the water is turned over. If you go to Canyon Ferry Reservoir in the spring down here in the uh, Missouri River, it takes about 40 days because the flow through is so high. So this is quite long. So we, we have um, 100,000 years, two, three, four, 500,000 years, okay? And here is a point where our math showed that uh, what happens is the gases keep concentrating, keep concentrating, and then they start forming clathrates. And this is about the size of a pea, and there's the gas in the middle with an icy cage. So what does that mean, you know? What, what's happening is the gases are being, con uh, concentrated, their oxygen alone is about 50 times seawater. And if you're a driller, even an oil driller in Texas or Oklahoma, you're going to stay away from that because you don't want to blow up. And so Lake Vostok supercharged with gases, just like a Coke bottle. All right. And I don't know if you've ever played the Mentos game. You might want to try it if you're not doing anything this weekend is take a two. This is a two liter um, uh, Coke bottle. And these kids here, Drop the little Mentos. Those are the mints you can always buy at airports and, and elsewhere. And it gases, it forms a gas. And that is the explosion that takes place with this Coca-Cola. So that's two liters. 
Lake Vostok's 5,400 cubic kilometers of water. It, if it blew out, it would be a disaster. So these are the kind of things you have to look at before you, you actually do the work. Well, the Russians, um, they did some of their math and they read our papers too, but they did break through into Vostok in February 2012. And they used a borehole that was full of kerosene. And they put the kerosene in so that the borehole doesn't squeeze shut. All right, ice is ductile and it doesn't. So they filled it with kerosene, it's quite contaminated too. And when they broke through, you can see the kerosene dripping off this bottom piece of the core. And I've now met this guy here, this uh, Russian driller. And you can see how sophisticated their equipment is here. These rheostats are real high top end. Plus this whole place is reeking of kerosene. So, but his, this is what the bottom of that uh, ice um, looked like down here from about uh, 3,769 meters. So they broke through and the water came up, but they kept drilling fluid in the hole so it did not blow out. So their math was good. And their first measurements of this ice were done by a colleague of mine, a Russian colleague, Sergei Bulat. And um, he, they studied some of this ice frozen into the drill. And I, I like the way this was stated that in nature is a very high profile uh, uh, science journal, no native microbes. Well, what they found is all contaminants because there's a lot of bugs that live in kerosene. You, for those of you who might drive a diesel vehicle, you can go buy, you know, you can buy diesel additive so that they keep the bacteria from growing inside your diesel fuel. So anyway, it was very inconclusive of their results. Um, so that, and they never really got into the lake. They just kind of broke through that last little surface bit, let the water rise up in and collected the ice. So here we a little politics when we know the next, we're really mired in politics right now. And so this is a CBS News clip here and Lake Vostok water given to Vladimir Putin, right? The uh, president of Russia and uh, prime minister of Russia. And they gave this to him, and I have highlighted this bit. So on national television in Russia, uh, the Re National Resource Minister gave Putin a canister of water that, from melted ice at the bottom of the borehole uh, of Lake Vostok. The footage was aimed at uh, showing Russia's scientific prowess and help, helping Putin uh, bid to reclaim the presidency in March's election. Okay. So Putin hailed the discovery as a great event, et cetera, et cetera. And he said the research team will receive national um, awards. Well, that's February 10th. This here in The Guardian came out uh, about four days later. And here's um, Mr. Putin looking at this really, it's uh, some water in a really fancy canister. But what it was, this was all a bit of a prop here. And uh, it, the water that he had was not really from the lake. And it was, uh, let's see if I can move something. I got so many things open here. There we go. So uh, down here in the bottom, it, I highlighted again, it's so that um, the head of the Russian Antarctic program, Valery Lukin, who's a friend of mine, uh, he admitted that it was not actually Lake Vostok water. And Valery Lukin doesn't have a job as the head of that program anymore. So anyway, uh, sometimes politics go awry. Okay, so let's see. Back in uh, 1999, I was able to get some ice cores from that accretion ice that water, lake water froze into the bottom. And we studied it here in my lab at Montana State University. And these are transmission electron micrograph images of bacteria. The, the, here's a scale, for example, one micron. So these bacteria are about a micron long. These are transmission electron micrographs. And this is a picture of, of an image we took uh, over in Kobli at our, our iCal facility here, uh, showing one uh, single bacterium from that core. And we were able to estimate a cell density of about 10,000 per mil. And that was published in a very high profile journal, a science journal over here. So that's the first evidence of life under the ice sheet, but we never really got into the lake. We were studying the ice above the lake. At the same time, we were also able to concentrate uh, viral particles. Uh, we studied viruses a lot, and they're, as we know right now, everyone should be concerned about viruses. 
Um, so uh, here's here's the drilling station. We went down through this glacial ice. Here's the accreted ice, kind of crunching out, going out over the lake, and here's the lake underneath. So from various depths, you can see these viral particles here. This is what a vi viruses look like. They're a lot smaller than those uh, um, micron-sized bacteria. These are all nanometer size. And if you look at some of these, uh, we we did not get enough material to examine their DNA to identify these. But it, this is a, a coronavirus of some kind, and you can see the receptors around the outside. And uh, then we have when we get into the lake. This one came from uh, the accretion ice, which is frozen lake water. We got this really wire, wild uh, virus with this. Uh, like a lollipop or a balloon, a big head and a very long tail. We haven't a clue what these viral particles are. Okay, so that's a little bit of the Russian program. They they popped through, they contaminated the lake a little bit, they got no data, and uh, and uh, the head of the program got fired because they tried using a, they, a little, playing a little politics with Mr. Putin, and that didn't work out. So the United Kingdom, went into, or tried going into a subglacial Lake Ellsworth. This is in West Antarctica. And I just want to show you some of the logistics. So they wanted to go through 3,000 meters. That's about 12,000 feet of ice. And here's their hose, big reel. Over here is their heater. So what they're going to do is use hot water. So I'm going to put a jet of hot water, whereas the Russians, I should have said this before, are actually going in with a mechanical drill with ice cutting edges and getting cores. You saw that core came out. Well, the the Brits uh, wanted to just melt their way down. All right, blast hot water down. So here's their big hose. It goes down this, over this crescent and down into the lake. Just a little bit of their logistics and some of the issues. So to get the drill, a hot water drill going, you need some water, liquid water. So they had these swimming pools of sorts here. And these are the scientists. This is what the scientists did for the United Kingdom, the Ellsworth Project. They shoveled snow like for like four days straight to get enough water to start drill, uh, the, the drill into the ice. Okay. And they had some problems with one of their solenoids. They had to get another one flown in on a Russian aircraft just before Christmas. And they also had a blowout preventer. And you can see these guys screwing this thing down on the ice. I had, there, I don't think there's any way in the world that that's going to stop a blowout in a lake if there's gases in it. There's a few things that I see wrong here. Firstly, they have the scientists doing all this work. If they ever got a sample, they'd be so uh, beat they couldn't work on it. Secondly, they're shoveling snow that's been pushed on by this piston bully. And if you've ever gone uh, at the ski area or along the side of a road where there's a plow, and you, after a, a, a piston bully or a blade has pushed it over, you know it's centered and really, really dense. And, and shoveling, it's real hard. I haven't a clue why they didn't. This has a blade on this piston bully, why they just didn't push, build a ramp with the tractor, just push it in. But anyway, that's not my say. So um, the way you, that, that you, you do a hot water drill, too, you, 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 you go down a little of Glaciology 101 here. Um, when when it snows on um, on a surface, okay, it can be a glacier anywhere in Antarctic. It's the ice sheet, okay. And then the next year it snows another ten centimeters. Next year, pretty soon it gets so heavy that that uh, snow down deep, around a hundred meters or so, turns into ice, okay. And then all the gases that were in the snow between the crystals turns into bubbles, okay. So the um, they call it firm, that upper part that's really uh, porous, and air can go through it and a soak in water. So the way we drill and with hot water is you drill down through that fern into the solid ice, and you put down like a well pump, a return pump to re pull water out. And then you drill a hole right down alongside it, the main borehole, and you, you want the two holes to connect so that you have a drill going down, melting, uh, with hot water and you have a return pump connected to that borehole so then you can adjust the uh, depth of of water in the borehole so um, anyway um, that's how we, the hot water drilling is done so the british or the, the united kingdom I, uh, they were they went really complicated so here's their probe they were going to put it do a one-shot deal it's covered in blue um, foam here to protect it from freezing and um, 
getting knocked around, but it, this thing was going to go down the hole and do everything. So if we start on the bottom down here, we start here, there's a little core, then there were some sensors for temperature and electrical conductivity, you know, measure the salts, things like that. And here's their um, um, controller for that, for those sensors. And then up here, there's uh, pumps to collect water and filter water. And so they're filtering material. They want to do DNA work, maybe. Whatever else they can do. And then uh, there are some sample bottles to bring water back for chemistry and whatever. And they were heated so they wouldn't freeze. The ice is about minus 50 centigrade. And here's some more bottles and with controllers in between. And then they, the brains of the whole thing and cameras were up on top. So this very complicated instrument was going to go down and actually um, do everything in one shot. Well, around Christmas Day, I got this email from my colleagues, one of my colleagues on the Ellsworth project, and I'll just read it quickly. This came on the 27th from Martin Tranter at Bristol. And it's, whoops, it, it says, hi, John, bad news, I'm afraid. We had to abandon drilling late Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Uh, when you're working down there, you go 24 seven, Christmas, New Year, it just doesn't matter. You just keep working. So our cavity at 300 meters did not connect to the main borehole. We tried for 40 hours to get the connection. This is the connection with that return pump and the main borehole. And finally, they ran out of water. They couldn't. Sh they could not shovel snow fast enough to melt it because the their water was flowing out through that fern ice, and they they lost. Uh, they ran into fuel problems, so they had to abandon it. So I, I tried getting f fuel flown into them from the United States, but uh, we just didn't have the logistics to do it. So uh, th they pulled out, and then the only uh, team left was the United States team. There's our American flag here. And we went over into West Antarctica. Here's the Ross ice shelf again, that floating ice shelf. We went into this little corner right here which is showing here. Well, let, let me just give you some perspective here. This black line is the grounding line. So the Ross ice shelf that floats over the ocean is on the right side. And this is actually a, a grounded ice on the continent. So this ice is flowing out, flowing out, and then it starts floating over the ocean right here at this grounding line. So it just floats up and that forms the Ross ice shelf. A couple other things you can see we've divided into, we now have enough data, we have a northern water catchment, a central and a southern. And the lakes, you can see there are the blue outlines. And we know these lakes are going up and down from satellite data. And uh, these kind of uh, turquoise lines are uh, rivers that we, we've uh, measured looking at the surface of the lake. So here's ISAT, which is a satellite that's measuring the surface of the lake and it we can see the lakes are going up and down just by the color some of them up to 10 meters this um, uh, subglacial lake Engelhardt's going up and down 10 meters at a time so it's a very active system and the red dots are gps systems these aren't your little backpacking gps's these are very very sophisticated gps units that are, that are measuring millimeter um, in three dimensions changes in three dimensions Okay, I just want to show you. So here's your ISAT. Okay, that's a satellite measure. And this satellite is so sensitive that if you were flying at 35,000 feet in a commercial airliner, with this satellite's altimeter, you could turn a page in a phone book and see the thickness change. That's how sensitive it is. Okay, um, GPS stations are red, etc. Over here are some data. And I'm just going to show you uh, this lake here, the subglacial Lake Mercer, which is this one here, we drilled it just a few years ago. And you can see that uh, the relative elevation is going up and down like six meters. So it, it drains, it fills, it drains, it fills, it drains, it fills, it drains, roughly on a 10-year scale. Remember, Vostok was, was more like 10,000 years. So these are very active lakes. So um, when... We wanted to, we wrote the proposal out of MSU, uh, very expensive, it's about $15 million proposal, and we, we bought a lot of equipment, but we, we wanted to test it before taking it to Antarctica, so we went to Lake Tahoe, not a bad place to test it, and we uh, rented a barge and put a crane on it and did all these tests, made sure everything worked. These projects, incidentally, Wizard is a, a they all have great names, acronyms, uh, Willens, um, uh, ice stream, subglacial Antarctic research drilling, and so also scientific 
Antarctic Lakes Scientific, uh, Subglacial Antarctic Lakes Scientific Access. And you can go to their websites and there's all kinds of cool movies and things. But we did a lot of testing. And our drill, we had a, a, quite a sophisticated cleaning system because the inter, you can't work in Antarctica and, and trash Antarctica. There's an international treaty, a scientific committee on Antarctic research has a code of conduct that we wanted to follow. We don't want to contaminate Antarctica. We don't want to contaminate our samples. So this is over in um, Ryan Lab, if you've ever been over between Ryan and Cobley in the fluids lab, but we, we've had this system built. Here's a, here's a two micron filter, this big silver thing. Water comes through it through a 0.2 micron. So this will take most bacteria out and it comes through and we can't see it very well, but behind uh, these people here, there's one filled system here and one behind uh, uh, at roughly chest high. Those are really intense UV lamps that just cook proteins and DNA so that the water we put down that borehole is cleaner than the actual um, water in the lake and the glacial ice. So we tested that here, published a paper on it, and uh, that's the team. We were here about two weeks doing these experiments. We also follow stringent environmental stewardships and sample integrity uh, rules, and this is how we do a lot of our sampling, all right? We, we start out like this, but I'll tell you what, and I think we're all going to find this in a couple months here. When the temperature gets about minus uh, 10 or below freezing, uh, masks really are hard. <laughs> they freeze to your face. And, you know, instead of your glasses fogging up, they ice forms. So good luck. Uh, we're through it. It's not easy. And our, we did a lot of tests with our PPE. And over in, um, uh, we did this over in Cobley. And they show that on average, humans exfoliate. That means just stuff coming off your skin and hair, about 50,000 bacteria each day on average. And if you don't bathe for a while, you run around, it's even worse. So we, are strong, uh, we were wearing masks a long time ago and full protective gear. It's not easy when it's sub-zero, I can tell you. Okay, now we got to get this drill and everything down there. All right, I'm talking logistic nightmares now. So what we did, we had about a million pounds of gear. We took, we put it on a ship to New Zealand, a vessel across the ocean. And then we flew 21 of these uh, flights of the C-17 Air Force flights uh, between um, New Zealand and McMurdo stations, about a five and a half hour flight. So it's like going from San Francisco to New York 21 times. And that's, um, that's how we got the stuff down there. And this is, uh, every seat has a view in a C-17. This is taken from my seat. This is one of our wizard uh, Willens, uh, Lake Willens cargo vessels. And that's a nice place to rest your feet. And you just hope that these chains hold everything. So the people are all sitting down the sides and that's our flight down for five and a half hours. Okay, so then now we have a million pounds of stuff uh, in McMurdo Station, which is a big U.S. hub research station. Now we have to get it out in the deep field. So we bought 12 tractors. And you can see these are not little tractors. They're pretty good size and they have cranes. A lot of them have cranes. To, and then we have, you can't see this one over here as a, a blade so we can push snow around when needed. All right. And we carried 1.2 million pounds from McMurdo Station where that ice runway was all the way out here in the West Antarctica and to this drill site. All these little dots are where the, the uh, traverse, the tractor traverse teams stopped and spent the night, okay? And here's just a picture taken from, here's a lab actually, and you can see all the tractors just pulling this out. It took 14 days and we carried 35,000 gallons of uh, diesel fuel, AN8, which doesn't, it's jet fuel basically, for aircraft and to run the drill. So you can see this is already, but it took 10 years to get to this stage. Okay, so this is before that tractor traverse arrived. That little dot right there is, uh, this is Lake Mercer. And it is uh, before the traverse arrived. Here's that dot again. And you can see the tractors came in here. They scratched out an area for our field camp. They scratched out an area for aircraft to land. And then they built a bunch of berms to put all the equipment up on top and let it overwinter so that it wouldn't drift in. 
And uh, it took them a month to do that. And then they went back to McMurdo. The scientists, we didn't uh, drive tr the tractors in. That's like a five mile an hour drive. I'm, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I think I'd go brain dead from that. But uh, one day maybe, but not two weeks. So we flew in in uh, these um, um, uh, military aircraft. And the first flight that we came, went in on got stuck. You can see this front ski. It's a big airplane. And this, the front ski got stuck. So the crew had to get out and shovel it. And the pilot's right here. And he's kind of reversing the prop and trying to get the airplane to rock, just like a car when you get stuck. And they uh, finally got it unstuck, but they couldn't take off. The snow was too deep. So they put on these rockets on the side, jet assist, and off they went, but they didn't have enough gas to make it back to McMurdo Station, so they had to stop at the South Pole and fuel. It's all in a day's work, right? Other aircraft we flew in were these uh, old, old, this is a 1946 DC-3 with turbines. You can see it's on skis. It's coming in to get fuel here, and uh, we flew in these quite a bit. The problem with those is they're not pressurized, and the pilots are like 25-year-old Canadian guys who uh, they just sit there where they put their feet up in, on the window and let it autopilot fly it, but they fly at 12 and a half thousand feet just under it so that they don't have to use oxygen. FAA rules over 12 and a half thousand feet, you have to use oxygen. So this is what it looked like in the back with no oxygen. Everybody was going kind of uh, hypoxic and you can see people are just passed on. Yeah. So this is another part of the rigors. Now I have to do this because uh, but these are three of my PhD students, and I, I showed them this picture, and they all said, oh, we're resting, so when we get to the field camp, we're ready to go. But anyway, it's uh, it's tough. I know when you just go down and take your uh, tie a shoelace, it's pretty uh, uh, tough. No uh, toilets or anything. It's really cold in there, and no uh, pressurized cabin. Um, we actually had them fly lower after this because a lot of our bottles were popping the tops out and stuff. And uh, so here's what it looks like taking your approach when you come in. This is a field camp for the Willens Project, the Wizard Project. It's really a small city. We had 52 people for about a month and a half. Here's where we lived in these tents. Here's the whole drill setup and sleeping area. And the tractors would park over in here. Here's a fuel berm. And here's the ice runway over here for the aircraft to land. And they have to have skis. Well, every day is not a holiday out there. Most of the days, this is what the weather was like, just ground blizzards, ground blizzards, as far as uh, you can see. And we slept in tents. And, and for you the campers out there, you should see, look at this right away, know exactly what's wrong with this guy's snow wall. Never build a snow wall this close to your tent because it totally drifted in. <clears throat> and this guy had to dig out in the morning. He was not getting enough oxygen because that tent totally went over. But um, next time you read something about Scott or Shackleton walking across the uh, Antarctic ice sheet, it, it, they really, that was amazing what they did. It's not level and the weather stinks. Okay, so here's a nice uh, view. This is also a photograph out of the airplane on a calm day. Here's our tents, okay, a couple outhouses. You can see tractors moving gear. This one has a blade and it keeps uh, the snow drifts down. We have a mess tent, cargo lines. Uh, we we do have a freezer, okay, because we need to keep our samples at a set temperature, and uh, that's what the freezer's for. And here's the whole operation for drilling. We have uh, two big generators down here, a control module for electric. This is our filtration and UV module for cleaning the water. Three big heating systems. We could run a car wash in Antarctica if we wanted, if there were cars. And then uh, elect a mechanical tent. And here, so the water over here is a little tractor filling our hot water tank, right? Melting the snow, like we saw the British doing, the, the United Kingdom guys. And we fill a tank here, and it's our priming water. It goes in here, gets uh, filtered and UV treated. It goes oh, then into these heaters, got, gets heated up to 95 centigrade, just under boiling. Then it gets pumped into this real house and goes right down the hose and down and drills. Okay, and it drills um, about a quarter meter a minute. That's pretty fast and it makes a hole about a half a meter in diameter. 
So it's a, there's a lot of heat going in. And here's our labs over here. Okay, so the samples come up from here, go right into the labs. Okay. All right, now I want to show you a couple videos. Uh, some of this will be uh, redundant, but I, but this is a nice video. Here's our lead driller. He's a, a, a lot of uh, the British had a real sophisticated engineer. This guy's a farmer from Nebraska that can fix anything. Dennis Dooling, and he's never complains. He fixes anything, work, works day and night. And that's the kind of person you want. He's holding the drill in his hand, the nozzle of the drill uh, before it went down in. And here's a, a, one of my students and myself actually collecting a water sample. So let's look at this video. And um, Sydney or somebody, if you can't hear the sound, please let me know. It sounds great. Wizard Thank scientists you. used a proprietary hot water drill to bore through 2,600 feet of ice and breach the surface of subglacial Lake Willems under the West Antarctic ice sheet. Water samples pulled from the lake showed a surprising number of live microbial cells, the first direct evidence of a complex ecosystem that thrives in one of the harshest environments on Earth. In the 1990s, ice probing radar and seismic mapping revealed there are more than 400 subglacial lakes beneath Antarctica's 8.7 million square mile ice sheet. But it was not until wizard scientists penetrated Lake Willens that there was decisive proof these bodies of water are teeming with life. Unlike at the surface, organisms live in a pitch black environment, devoid of sunlight and photosynthesis, yet they are part of a complete food chain with those at the bottom drawing their energy from chemicals in rocks and sediment in the lake bed. It is similar to microbial communities that exist around hydrothermal vents deep in the ocean. The wizard team took precautionary measures to ensure the lake was not contaminated by their drilling and sampling activity, not only because they were looking for definitive scientific results, but because they realized introducing any foreign material could alter the ecosystem. The discovery of organisms living in the Antarctic ice supports the idea that life may exist elsewhere in the solar system, such as under the polar ice caps on Mars or in a subsurface ocean on Jupiter's frozen moon, Europa. But for now, there is much more work to be done as wizard scientists continue to investigate our planet's last unexplored aquatic ecosystem. One of the most pressing issues that we're addressing is uh, deals with climate change. We're standing on one of the world's largest ice shelf, about the size of France below us. And if this ice shelf melts, we're going to lose ice from West Antarctica really, really rapidly, very fast. Sea level will, will rise. We've seen other ice shelves collapse around the continent in the last about decade or so. This is the first field camp. The National Science Foundation has funded in the Antarctic, it's just a deep field camp that includes a geomicrobiology component. So it took a, a, a different slant. We have clean access. People are walking around in Tyvek suits. And the drill is, uh, has been outfitted with a system that uh, uh, is sterile. And so when we bring up samples, it's completely clean. All right. So that uh, really encapsulated what, uh, maybe I should just go home now and have dinner. <laughs> no, we're going to wrap this up pretty quick. But once we broke through, this is what one of the control rooms looked like we, in one of those red buildings. Um, so we had video uh, monitors throughout the camp. And this guy right here was one of my PhD students. He was the one who was sleeping or passed out in the airplane. And he's very happy because he was able to get his samples and he uh, got his PhD. Now he's a research scientist uh, on the East Coast. So if this is really the moment you live for as a scientist, and he'll never forget that as a graduate student. And here's what we saw uh, from the Willens. We saw a lot of bacteria, and you can see all these little guys here. All these images were taken here at MSU, and um, we were able to uh, get an idea and publish it in a, a magazine, um, Journal Nature, which is one of the highest profile journals uh, on the planet. So uh, it was great, a, a great moment. Also, the media followed us very closely. And uh, New York Times on January 14th had a headline uh, deep under Antarctica looking for signs of life. And in that short period between January 14th and February 6th down here, uh, we transformed the way the Antarctic continent was, was viewed. We finally found life in the cold underneath. 
And I remember making the phone call from McMurder Station to Jim Gorman and telling him we saw the life, we know it's alive, and uh, we had two different uh, methods of showing that it was uh, the organisms were viable, and that's when we released the, the information. So that was very exciting, and it made uh, number 12, which isn't too bad, I guess, uh, in Discover Magazine for that year, um, in a search for life trapped under ice. So that was uh, that was pretty cool, but besides that publicity, what really is a scientist um, it hits home close, and this is why we really do it, at least I do. Uh, we received about a million hits that week on our website, and we had a, a portal where you could you could send in to a, a contact on our website here. Okay, and we received this message from uh, a, a person I, I've never heard of, I don't know him, and I've never followed up with him someday maybe. But uh, um, uh, my administrative assistant forwarded this one particular message to me. I extend my congratulations for your recently announced discovery of microbial life beneath the Antarctic ice covering Lake Williams. Many Americans are rabid to eliminate government funding for all but the most basic civic functions. I think Wizard is a shining example of why this approach is so wrongheaded and the amazing things that can be accomplished when government supports fundamental scientific research. I'm one U.S. citizen who is extremely proud that my taxes have gone to fund, in even a small part, this groundbreaking project. So that's pretty cool. You know, this is a lot of, I told you it's a multi-million dollar project, and uh, we have taxpayers that uh, can get behind this and shine a little light in their life. Also, we have a lot of sci-fi writers out there, and I. this is just one of them. This is Danielle uh, Calla. And... This uh, guy here wrote, uh, he also had a, a bestseller called Pandemic, very uh, um, appropriate name for the times. But this book here called Cold Plague, uh, and it says over here, I don't know if you can read it, Michael Creighton, uh, you, you, you be careful of someone's looking, you know, coming down over your shoulder. And because this book here is a thriller and by uh, Kala. And basically, this is a little clip I took from the New York Times Review. So pristine water, untouched from the. So he's these guys are reading our our work, uh, at least the uh, the lay articles we published. So pristine water, untouched for millions of years, and possessing natural healing powers, is discovered miles under Antarctic ice. Okay, we did that. The scientists who claim the water stand to win a worldwide acclaim and make billions. Well, we didn't do that, <laughs> but yet as people line up for a taste of the therapeutic water. New cases of mad cow disease uh, explode in rural France. And then Dr. Noah Haldane and of, of the World Health Organization moved in uh, to save the world and to sound the alarm. Okay, so this is this book. I, I have it on my shelf back here. I've never read it, uh, but mad cow disease was real, and uh, it's um, they call it, it's BSA bovine spongiform. And cephalop and cephalopathy, and that really to shut down the British uh, cattle industry for three years. It got it picked up in, in in the United States, and it was around for uh, about a decade. And it was really bad way. It was a neuro disorder uh, caused by a, a, a prion, which is a protein that mutated. So anyway, so the the press had a heyday with what we were doing as well. And I would get a free copy of the book, and, and they would say. Hey, keep up the good work. Uh, you, you're fodder for our work, something like that. So anyway, so the last thing, and I'm going to run wrap this up. Let's go to a Mercer Subglacial Lake, which we sampled just a few years ago. Um, wrote another proposal out of MSU. Had a lot of MSU graduates involved. And here's the, the shape of the lake again, using um, this a digital elevation map, um, showing the deep part here and shallower parts here. Okay. And this lake goes up and down with water flow up to 20 meters. Okay, so the ice thickness is 1,092 meters. It's a lot of ice. Uh, the water depth's only 15 meters. The volume in, in the lake uh, is a, about 2.4 cubic kilometers, and the surface area is about uh, two times the size of Manhattan Island. So it's not a Lake Vostok by any means, but it's a, a, a viable hydraulically active lake. And here's a little cutaway of what it looks like. So here's our borehole. I put a little schematic down and we broke into the lake down here, this 15 meter deep lake. 
Um, and as we drill, the borehole's full of water because we're melting ice as we go. And that water stops the lake from blowing out the pressure through the top. We didn't want that to happen. And so when the water comes up, it reaches a hydrostatic level. Just when, like when you put um, your ice cubes in a, a cup or a glass, they, they, they float so that some of the ice up, uh, is in the air above your drink. And uh, so we had about 100 meters of air we had to go through. And then we went through all this glacial ice. And I'm going to show you a movie of this. It's pretty cool. And then we sampled this lake down on the bottom. Uh, not an easy feat, but uh, we're getting pretty good at this. Okay. One thing that we really developed for this um, salsa project is um, a deep skinny or remotely operated vehicle. So we call it deep skinny because here it is. It's skinny and it goes down a borehole. It goes down through 3,600 feet of ice or deeper. And it swims around and just like this takes pictures. Here's the control room. Here's the two operators and scientists in the back. And they're watching all the stats come out and watching the videos. It's quite an operation for being way out in the middle of Antarctica, West Antarctica. Okay, here it is going down again uh, uh, into the borehole. So inside the um, control room, you can see the bottom of the ice sheet. I'm going to show you a movie of this in a minute. But here's the bottom of the ice sheet. This is the lake, and this is uh, the ice. It's really dirty because it must have grounded somewhere as, it, as that ice was moving down, and sediment froze into the bottom of the ice, which has it's very it's important scientifically, but I don't have time to talk about that. Uh, you see a squirting stuff all over. It's not water. We're squirting hydrogen peroxide on everything, just like the disinfectant we see around the MSU and all the labs. That so uh, three percent hydrogen peroxide really kills uh, bacteria, et cetera, and it also eats a lot of holes in your clothes too. So the Tyvek has another uh, purpose. And even though we have a lot of sophisticated uh, equipment like all these cameras, we put these little whiskers on the bottom of our uh, cam um, deep skinny so that we could with a camera above it, so we could make sure the borehole was was. Uh, wide enough we wanted it to be almost a half a meter so that we could put our tools up and down the borehole so we did this very crude mechanical way of uh, measuring the borehole and we also had laser altimetry but in the end we use these visuals so here's putting the system down in the borehole and i want to show you a video taken by um we're using the onboard cameras and this was a master student here at msu who is in uh film and TV program, I brought on two people from over there to help uh, with the education and outreach component. So here we go. So what you're seeing is we're at the top and, and you, you see this collar around the top? That's a huge UV lamp that disinfects everything. So this is a camera looking up and the lamp just turned on. And this wire is being lowered from the surface. This is 100 meters down. This is the ice, or the air water interface. So we're now in the borehole. We have about 3,500 more feet to go. Like, this is sideways looking cameras. This is ice, the sediment particles in it. Goes the bottom of the ice sheet, which is just amazing. No one ever thought we'd ever have pictures of the bottom of the ice sheet. And there's the bottom of the lake. And you can see that, that material, that sediment that was in the bottom, some of it fell out, okay? And here's the footage. Uh, Kathy Kasich was a prof here over in film and TV. Billy was a master's student. So that worked out really well for everybody. And we now have videos going around. And if you go to that Salsa website, uh, that's, a, that's a Twitter, but if you go to Salsa and do, make sure you put Antarctica after Salsa, <laughs> you're gonna get a lot of weird stuff that we don't do, okay? And uh, and you'll see the full length videos on there, and they're pretty cool. So um, and that was Billy's master's degree. Okay, so uh, we did get water samples up. This is a bottle of the lake water from under thirty six hundred feet of ice. This is how we collected with these um, oceanographic water samplers. This is me bringing one of the samples into the, a, a lab. Here's all of our happy campers, our scientists waiting for the water to come in. And uh, then they pipette it and they do DNA. Here's a, 
Uh, we're looking right away at bacteria using uh, DNA stains, and we do it all right out in the lab. So it was a big team, a lot of effort, no sleep, three days without sleep on this one. And you can see, we unfortunately, the face mask didn't work because it was so cold outside that we uh, um, didn't have any luck. So here's what it looks like. Here's bacteria. What we do is stain the samples with uh, a DNA stain so it fluoresces under a microscope. And all this uh, yellow, if this is a cyber gold stain, it's kind of yellow gold stain, or bacteria. Hey, that's a big one there. It's five microns, a little bigger than five. So all kinds of shapes. Here's stock bacteria, little filamentous bacteria. So we found about 10,000 cells per mil in that lake. Remember, that lake's been covered for hundreds of thousands of years, if not longer, and has never had light um, to this community. So these organisms are quite unique. This time we were ready for viruses. And I, I had a postdoc here, Dr. Wei Li, who uh, took this on, this virus stuff. And you can see uh, a couple of images he took here. These were taken here. Uh, this is another coronavirus type looking thing. Um, uh, coronavirus is an RNA virus. Um, so uh, we've got these pictures. And here's what a, we, we also stained their DNA. And these VLPs are virus like particles. You can barely see them but we can actually count those particles. And there's about a million per milliliter viral particles. These are transmission electron micrographs. That's 35 nanometers, 38 nanometers. So we were seeing viruses all over the place. And what my postdoc did, we were able to concentrate. This is really complicated, but it's kind of a cool story to end up with tonight. Um, and we were able to, uh, extract the DNA. So this won't tell us Corona, uh, won't tell us COVID. COVID's an RNA virus. It's only DNA viruses. This is hard enough just for DNA. And all the little blue particles or little dots or little wedges, if you want, dashes, are all the viruses um, known, of DNA viruses known, that have been deposited in this database. So it's really all the known DNA viruses on our planet. And what we did then is took our, the DNA that we extracted, and we extracted these from Lake Mercer, Lake Willens, and then another lake in the Transarctic Mountains, Lake Bonnie. And we compared it to the known viruses on our planet. And you can see some of them are close to these known viruses, this one here. So these are DNA sequence, the comparisons. Some of them are close to this group here, okay? Uh, some over in here. But really what stands out is we can, we have a, a, a completely unique virion. So this is a virus that's not in our, our global database, DNA virus. We don't know what it is, uh, but we're still working on it. Here's another distinct group and another distinct group. So going into these ancient envir environments where um, we're, we're uncovering some unknown viruses, we worry about that a little bit. And so I went to the CDC early on in the game and told them we're going to be doing these samplings and uh, they didn't uh, seem to mind. So we did it. We have the DNA here and uh, we've done the analysis. So this, this is pretty interesting. Uh, what we're doing now, most of these viruses are phage. These viruses attack bacteria and uh, being microbiologists, that's kind of, we're not medical people. Um, so we're trying to see what bacteria they infect. Uh, really, really important. So higher life, well, we found some big guys. Here's a tardigrade, a little water bear. We found this crustacean, but we only saw one of each. And I put these, a lot of question marks because I don't believe it, but we have them, we have pictures. And uh, if there's hi higher life forms, that's going to be pretty cool. That could mean these are organisms that fish eat, although we didn't see any fish, but uh, okay. So I'm going to wrap this up. So why is this important, what we do? Um, so we, um, we, we, here's the grams of bacterial carbon in Antarctica, these subglacial environments it's up here around 10 to the 15th. It, it blows away all the fresh waters on our planet. It's not as important or high as the ocean or soils, but there's more bacterial carbon associated with these subglacial environments and there are, there is carbon in the human population. So they contain a globally relevant yet virtually ignored pool of microorganisms. All right, so I'm gonna wrap this up. And when we look at this, our, our 
planet again. We see green and blue, right? We, we you know, it's a green planet, a blue planet. But when we look at Antarctica again, and I've written this now in book chapters, I'd like to see this um, um, a little greener because it's not just this big benign block of ice. It's actually a, a living, uh, there's a living ecosystem under there. So what's next? We're strongly involved. There's a paper we published not too long ago using the data we have to look at uh, life uh, beyond Earth and the outer solar system. And uh, the 2023 launch is supposed to go up here to uh, Europa, moon of Jupiter. If you look out, there's no clouds tonight. You can see that moon. Uh, Jupiter's out. And you, can, you can't see the moons of Saturn because it's kind of lost in its rings. But there's more liquid water out here in the outer solar system than there is uh, on Earth. Okay, so I probably went over a little bit. Um, I, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Again, thanks for hanging in there, guys. It's hard to do on a computer. That was awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Priskew. Um, if anyone has any quick questions, we're happy to take them now. If you have any other questions, you're also able to email honorspresents at montana.edu. You can email specific questions for Dr. Priskew to that email address, and they'll get to him. Or you can email just general questions up to you guys. Is there any quick questions now? You can either unmute yourself and ask or post them in the chat. Come on, somebody asked me a question. No? So I got a question. Did you fly all of those 21 or 25 flights or did you only fly a couple oh, of them? No, I did. That's a good question. Oh my gosh. No, we call those aircraft tubes of pain. <laughs> you know, there, there's no windows. It, uh, the jets aren't bad. The, the, the Hercules aircraft just b vibrate. You can put in those canceling headsets and they don't cancel. They just break up. And oh. Your batteries burn out. So, no, I flew down on one and uh, flew out on one. And uh, a lot of the other ones just kept bringing in cargo and then packs people back and forth. And uh, they just kept coming. And of course, all the other scientific projects got mad at us for taking all the resources. Oh, so yeah. um, I did not fly them all, but. Um, the Department of uh, Defense um, has a contract with the National Science Foundation to support uh, research down there. And uh, they're Who's pretty cool. all the caterpillars? Pardon me? Who did you have drive all the tractors yeah. down there? So the tractors uh, were the, uh, the, um, the support contractor, which uh, the support contractors turn over about every five to 10 years. Uh, the current one is uh, Lockheed Martin or Laedos, they call it. It was a subset, but it's basically Lockheed. Uh, before that, it was Raytheon. So these are big contractors. Uh, I think Raytheon used to run Kate, uh, uh, Kennedy. Uh, so it's they hire, and if you want to go to uh, Antarctic Support uh, Contractors, ASC, you can, uh, uh, if you know how to drive a tractor and you want to do it, you can see if you can get a job. Unfortunately, this year there's no, they're going nowhere. It's like the, the season's pretty much on hold. So, but um, they do hire a lot of uh, contractors to do all kinds of stuff. Um, I did get a chat question. How is it like working with the Russians? Great question. Really interesting. <laughs> I, uh, I've been to Russia many times. I was supposed to be there in October next month giving a lecture, very similar to what I've given you here at a, uh, a Russian conference. Um, you know, uh, but I, I was I started working with the Russians when it was still Soviet Union. I was over there in the early 90s, and it was quite interesting then. Uh, very Eastern. I didn't hadn't seen many Westerners, and uh, um, but they're great, great, great people. Really warm people. Um, the politics are really, really interesting. Uh, I remember in Moscow back then. Uh, they all of a sudden in August there was no hot water. And the water came out brown out of the tap anyway. And I asked, why is there hot water? And they said, they, they don't ask. It's just, it's communism. And you just, um, um, it's just what happens. Uh, they're great people to work with. Uh, they're, they work with, they're really hard, gracious people. Um, the politics are a little messy, as you saw with Putin when they tried getting him reelected by showing their scientific prowess. And then he fired the guy who said, no, I'm sorry, it's, it really wasn't Vostok water. Okay, I have another chat question, if that uh, 
uh, I'll read it. I don't know. Can you see the chat question? Or the... Um, go ahead and read it. Okay. Uh, Why do you know everyone... that the samples were from the actual lake water? Oh, good question. And not melted ice within the glaciers from drilling the obvious. That, uh, man, that's you should be a driller and a scientist. Um, we, we went to great extremes, and I just finished a manuscript I wrote that's in review in the Annals of Glaciology, showing how we did all that. And first thing that came up, you saw in that one picture with me with that big gray tube, that's a sampler that goes down in, into the lake to a selected depth. We have a, a metered cable going down in uh, over 3,000 feet. And we bring it up and we look at the we look at the salt content. We just measure electrical conductivity and we know uh, what it is in the borehole, which is really, really low. No lines. The lake's quite high. And one of the first instruments we put down is a temperature conductivity probe. And you can see down the borehole, it's really, really, really fresh. And I would say fairly warm. It's like minus uh, 0.5 centigrade. And once we get into the lake, the, the salt content increases drastically and it gets quite cold. The lake water is about minus 0. 0.5 centigrade and it's below the freezing point because of the pressure down there. Okay, if you put a lot of pressure, just like an ice skater, if you're watching hockey, you know, the go Golden Knights. Right? I'm, I'm from Vegas. I'm all for the Knights. Anyway, uh, you, that's how you ice skate, right? You put that pressure on a, your blade and uh, it, it, forms, it melts the ice. So... Um, that's how we do it. That's a great question. And that's the first thing we measured. And we went around and around on one of our first samples. Somebody did not believe that it was a lake water sample. And I told them I, I was out on deck collecting it and uh, we it was a lake water sample. So uh, yeah, everything's good. And oh, I should also say um, it, within our drilling system, um, and I should have pointed this out when I showed you the picture of the tests in the lab, there are valves all over it. And every day, sometimes three times a day when we're in the lake, we're opening those valves and sampling the borehole water to make sure that it's not contaminated. And if there is any contamination, we know what it is so that uh, um, we know uh, we just kind of track everything we're doing. Okay, I love the nights. Me too. Yeah. I also happen to be a figure skater as well. Great. Thank you for answering my question. Yeah, good. Yep. So I think the Knights are going to take it, but they sure should have yet last year. But anyway, it's another story. Anybody else? I think we have two more questions. Oh, how long what does is it the take? plan going forward? Okay. Um, are there still plans to explore the lakes? Uh, lakes that have already been bored. Great and question. How long does it take to drop the sample yeah. collector machines from the okay. surface of the lake? Okay. okay, let me roll scroll up. The questions are coming. I didn't see the scrolling part. Okay, let me, uh, how long does it take? It takes about two hours and a half to get down and about two hours and a half to get back up. So if you went into Vostok, it would take, um, um, it would take you a, a full 24 hours to collect one sample because it's so, it's, it's two miles thick, so, so deep. So it takes us about um, half a day to get a sample up. That means starting at the surface, spraying it all down with our peroxide, putting it through that UV collar, dropping it down through, and then uh, and, and then going into the lake and, and you know measuring or monitoring the feed out on the line. So it takes a while, and you sit on the surface, and there's some great videos on our website where somebody's looking at the metering device saying, oh, only another thousand feet to go. <laughs> you know, like, okay. So we drink a lot of coffee because we have to sit out there in the cold and the wind. So that's how long it takes. Um, uh, what is the plan going forward? That's a great, great question. Um, so right now, um, let me talk about my plans and uh, maybe others. I, I think a lot of people are as crazy as I am to do this and, you know, write these crazy proposals and trying to get people together from all over the world to work on them. And, uh, it takes it's a lot of effort. Uh, the Salsa project is still going. We're making a full length Nova special right now on the project. And if, if you do go to salsa.org Antarctica, you'll see videos up there that are pretty cool um, and a lot of images. So um, I've become really involved now with uh, NASA and I was uh, the Mars launch that went up uh, about three weeks ago. I was 
involved with the coring device on that to bring samples back. And uh, I'm also involved with a, a, a human mission to Mars and uh, to put a um, an orbiter and a lander on Europa right over here. Okay. So that launch is supposed to go in about two or three years if, if the budget holds. These are $14 billion launches, so they're not, they're not cheap. It takes a long time to go out there. And we've also, I've been to think tank meetings at Caltech and JPL uh, to try and figure out how to get through the ice on here. The ice that, uh, on Europa is 10 kilometers thick. So it's, it's two to three times, four times thicker than anything we have in Antarctica. And... Uh, what I would like to see if I if I wrote another grant, I'm 68, so I'm not sure. I, it's probably time to turn it over to the next generation, but I would like to see us go to Vostok. And um, if we can't sample Vostok cleanly, we should not be going out here to Europa. Um, the Russians have, uh, they ran out, of their economy tanked, and uh, they've pulled out their work on Vostok. They still have a station there, and they're doing glaciology. I think we need to go there and uh, and do it uh, cleanly uh, and start to get away from their station where it is. It's all contaminated um, and, and go and try to get right now. We could easily do it, but we need uh, thermal nuclear generators. And uh, the Antarctic Treaty calls for no nuclear devices in Antarctica, which I, I'm fine with that. But, uh, you know, you're working up over 10,000 feet at minus 80 centigrade, you know, minus 100 Fahrenheit or colder. And it's really, really tough. And the fuel doesn't have a lot of BTUs in it at that altitude. So um, that's where we go next. Right now, we're still working up our salsa data. We hope to get the virus work published and uh, a lot of other things. Their papers are coming out uh, as we speak. And, uh, I, and then I'd say in another year, uh, I've been putting it on our uh, bi-weekly science uh, Zoom meetings, our agendas, that uh, what's next, guys? And uh, so um, I don't think I'll be the chief scientist. I've done it twice now, and it's, uh, it's, it's beyond full-time work. So, But I always have some good stories to tell students, and they, they love it, and I get a lot of grad students that want to do this job. So it's, yeah, it's very rewarding. I'm, anyway. That's awesome. I think at this point, we're going to have to cut questions off there. Thank you so much, Dr. Priscu. That was okay. a wonderful presentation. We All can't right, wait to yeah, have you back. Thank you guys. And stay healthy, okay? And have a great semester. Bye. Bye. Make sure you copy the link in the chat to receive credit. Just click on it. You want me to do that? Can I get credit for this? <laughs> you cannot get credit, unfortunately. Oh, Unless okay. you want to go and take honors 201, texting you critics. Know, I think I was too busy playing uh, hockey and soccer when I was a kid to do honors, but uh, that's not saying <laughs> anything wrong. But whatever, keep working, you guys. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you.